Yeah, what, what brought me to neuroscience was first that I wanted to learn as much as I could about life. And this is why I studied medicine, because I thought this would teach me how a normal organism functions and how it functions in disease states. And during my studies, I attended a seminar uh, that was given by a neurobiologist, Otto Kreuzfeld, my later mentor and thesis advisor, and a very orthodox uh, Freudian uh, psychotherapist, Paul Matusek. And they made a, a joint seminar on the question of the neurobiological foundations of consciousness. And I thought, this is fantastic. There is an attempt to find a material basis for something immaterial like consciousness. So I inscribed in the seminar, and this followed, had actually followed the seminar on the um, evolution of uh, mankind, the increase of uh, cerebral size and the emergence of culture. And so <clears throat> these two events together made that I decided I should go into neuroscience. And after this seminar, I asked my future mentor, not the psychoanalyst, whether I could do a thesis with him. And then he told me that, yes, in principle this is possible, but you will have to learn a lot more. And, but he kept in touch with me and uh, helped me in my subsequent studies to orient myself towards neuroscience. And then he took me as a thesis a student and I did my PhD with him. And this was the beginning. And I s remained there since, even though I continued to work as an MD um, on a regular schedule until I was called to Frankfurt, uh, actually in the cabinet of my father, who was serving on the countryside as a general practitioner. And twice a week I went there to, to do normal medicine, which I greatly enjoyed and, of course, could continue here. Yeah, I have always been active in, in reaching out to the public and explaining to them what we do. Um, not so much my, my own work only, because that is highly specialized and not so easy to communicate. But um, I try to convey to them the state of the art and the way of thinking in neurobiology uh, with all its consequences for our self-understanding. And um, there are, of course, numerous findings in neuroscience that uh, are considered as an attack to our narcissistic self. like the idea that mental phenomena can emerge from material processes, the idea that brain processes follow the laws of nature, so they are deterministic, they follow the causal law, and these processes underlie our decisions, which means our decisions cannot be as free as one would like to have them. Um, then also, neurobiologists have to defend a uh, naturalistic view of the world, a, a monistic view. For us it is not conceivable that there be an independent entity that is uh, ontologically different from our material <coughs> existence that nevertheless has our identity, has our soul, and uh, is doing the job of mental processing for us. And when it decides something, it would have to influence our brain so that the brain executes what this immaterial something has dis decided. Also for us it's difficult to imagine that our immaterial existence would continue beyond our physical death, because neurobiologists know too well that what we are is the product of um, of our brains, I shouldn't say only. Uh, we are what we are because we are a, an integrated system that uh, has a history, that has an education, but nevertheless our mental uh, dimension owes itself to the existence of brain processes, of cognitive processes, which in turn are the consequence of genetic instructions, epigenetic shaping, and then all lifelong experience that we have. And um, we have so much evidence that uh, a particular lesion in the brain leads to the destruction of certain mental functions, that it would be hard for us, at least for me, to believe that 
I continue somehow when I am no longer uh, here in my material outfit. So all these um, insights that one gains from <laughs> looking at, at the brain from the third person perspective rather than from the subjective first person perspective and introspection, they, they are not always comfortable. And so this, of course, when you go public, uh, leads to discussions and sometimes you get attacked for it. Um, also, we work, of course, with animals because we cannot um, be satisfied with the non-invasive techniques that we can apply to human brains because their spatial and temporal resolution is just not sufficient to understand what's going on in the brain. Even worse, had we not analyzed brains with, in great detail with animal experimentation, we wouldn't be able to interpret anything that we see in these non-invasive imaging technologies. So we need it. Therefore, we do it. And this, of course, raises other concerns. Can you inflict harm to sentient beings um, to satisfy your curiosity? Um, this is the hardest argument to fight against because in basic research in the beginning um, <clears throat> you don't really know what you're going to find nor do you know what it can be applied for. So all you have is the historical um, evidence that on the long run knowing more about the world will help to alleviate uh, problems and suffering because the better your model of the world and of yourself, the more adapted is your action towards the world. So acquiring knowledge is something that has a value in itself. And then there are these utilitaristic arguments that sometimes um, you can you discover something that can be used to fight a disease, to develop new therapies, but you never know before. So. <clears throat> You do it without really being able to, to say, I do it because it will um, lead to this and this uh, therapeutic agent or advance in, uh, in medicine. But if we didn't do it, uh, we would still sit in caves. One can opt for this, it would not be my option. Um, so all these are discussions that we have in the public. Uh, ethical considerations are discussed about the consequences of science, also with respect to the change in our self-understanding. Uh, I, I heard more than once that <clears throat> I should not go public with, with these notions of restricted free will because people will think, well, um, if, if I'm not as free as I think, then I am not responsible for what I do and then I shouldn't be punished and then this opens the door for anarchy. <laughs> which is, of course, a wrong conclusion. But uh, these are problems that arise if you go public with these uh, insights. Well, I, I definitely see a change over the, over the last decade or two um, in, in philosophy uh, where ontological dualist positions become less and less popular. Um, and there are all sorts of explanations offered now how phenomena like consciousness could emerge from material processes. Um, but um, there is a, I, I think the, the way of thinking gets more and more penetrated by um, evidence taken from the natural sciences. This I see. Um, with respect to the, um, to the law system, also things have changed. Um, from the many discussions I had with, with judges and philosophers of, of law, um, I learned that the concept of guilt, that um, we are usually uh, assuming to be necessary in order to be able to punish behavior, is actually not <clears throat> what they had in mind to begin with. Um, when they mean guilt, which is in Deutsch uh, schuldig, 
uh, which means more that it, it addresses less the moral um, culpability, but <clears throat> the responsibility uh, of having committed something. Um, so if you say he is schuldig, excuse me for this German word, he is, he is guilty, it, this only means um, that it is clear now that he has committed what has been, what, what has, had happened. Uh, so it's um, an attribution of authorship. And once this is, is clarified, <clears throat> then um, you ascribe, of course, responsibility to the actor, because we, we are responsible for what we do, then nobody would doubt this. And then the society has the right to, to sanction what you did if it is against the rules. <clears throat> so, I think negating that the will is as free as we had initially thought, which also is not a new discovery. I mean, Schopenhauer already said you can't want otherwise than you want. It's not possible. It doesn't change so much the procedures according to which we sentence people's behavior and sanction it, <clears throat> but it um, changes the attitude. Um, because we are more inclined now to accept that um, a brain that is able to perform horrible things must be <clears throat> in a state that one could describe as sick or not normal. Um, and there are different forms of abnormality. You could be in the moment abnormal because of some dynamical changes or some chemical changes. But you, there is also a constitutive abnormality. You could be genetically miswired, or you could have <clears throat> some problems in the coordination of brain processes that make you do things that other people wouldn't do. And this raises a big problem in, in jurisdiction, because if you have somebody, and there are cases <clears throat> reported, where people all of a sudden started to um, to become extremely asocial and uh, misabuse their own children, for example. And I know of one case where months later, after the, the man had already been in jail, it was discovered that he had a brain tumor. And then the tumor was removed, was in the frontal, prefrontal cortex, and then his behavior renormalized again. <clears throat> so he was uh, taken out of jail, and in the beginning he was taken to a clinic, of course. Now. There are many other possibilities for brains to go, to go astray, like uh, false connectivity or insufficiency of certain transmitter systems. Now, these are things we cannot see from outside. <clears throat> but still, we know as neurobiologists um, what can go wrong and what the behavioral consequences will be if it goes wrong. And the question then is, is, of course, an important one. Um, should it depend on the, on the power of our analytical methods, whether somebody is sent to jail or to clinic? And this is an unresolved question. The better we get in diagnosing abnormalities, the less people will go into jail and the more will go into clinics. But um, we can only do what we can do. I think in the moment there is there's little to be done. Um, I think the most powerful um, way to manipulate brains is propaganda and indoctrination. And it works in both ways. Um, if, you, if you think back in our own German history, these were well-adapted, normal people um, who within a few years could be talked into becoming monsters. Um, Maybe that at the beginning they were more susceptible of being talked into these ideologies and this in-group, out-group segregation and considering minorities as, as uh, <clears throat> not worth living uh, because they already had a, uh, an injured self-confidence to begin with. They, they had been maybe dishonored by the history, God knows what. So they were perhaps more susceptible than other people, but collectively it was possible to, to turn around a whole nation and then to have behaviors that are very difficult to understand, that uh, 
we know from these SS <coughs> soldiers who were in, in the extermination camps in Auschwitz, for example, that they were living there with their families. In, in, in the evening they were with their children and they probably playing piano to them or reading Goethe or whatever. And the next morning they went on the ramp and sorted out children. Um, so the human brain can do these horrible things um, on the one side. And it's enough to indoctrinate it and tell it that what they do is good for something. I think this is evolution went one step too far in getting us this big prefrontal cortex. It can dominate all the other instincts. Well, I think it will be unavoidable that, that the natural sciences and the humanities uh, start to team up and find a common language for the description of the world, because I believe the word is coherent. There, there is no such a thing than um, a cultural word that is dissociated from, uh, from the, the, the biological world. Because, after all, <coughs> the one followed the other. And if you look into, into cultural evolution, um, we had uh, early, early men with the cognitive abilities that we have, so theory of mind, uh, symbolic coding, ability to communicate at a symbolic level, develop language. They started to exchange their views on each other and on the world, finding terms for it, and started to build what we call social realities, the contents of culture, belief systems, value systems. So <clears throat> this, this came out of the interaction of brains that have certain cognitive abilities. And these cognitive abilities, in turn, are the consequence of the evolution of, of highly differentiated brains. So you see this, this continuum. Evolution produces ever complex brains. These develop ever complex cognitive abilities with all the attributes that we attribute to us. So, as I said, theory of mind, symbolic coding, um, formation of invariants, uh, abstract thinking. And if you take organisms that have such brains and cognitive abilities and, inter and let them interact with each other, in our case they created culture until they erected cathedrals. And they developed moral systems and political systems, social systems, and also <coughs> They attributed to each other a certain image of what it is to be to be man, or mankind, or be human. So all these are constructs that we have brought into the world. They weren't there before we were there. So I see a continuum here, and our task is to explain this continuum. And neurobiologists usually should stop at the moment where they describe the cognitive functions that are based on brain processes. And the humanities, so far, they have been describing the phenomena that emerged from the interaction of these brain-possessing animals. Uh, so for me, it's natural that we talk about the same world with different languages, different Sprachspiels, because we describe different phenomena. But it, the difference to me is not much more than a difference that we already know, um, we describe behavior. Uh, when, when we describe a, an, an organism, it has a particular behavior. And then we try to explain this behavior by the underlying functions of its nervous system. Now, to describe the nervous system, we need one sort of language. To describe the behavior, we need another sort of language. But it's obvious that these two are linked. And I see the same with um, the next level of complexity, which is the interaction of um, organisms, humans endowed with our cognitive abilities that interact with each other and create culture. So there were people who described all the phenomena of this cultural system. And now the neurobiologists come and describe the system that brings about the cognitive functions which, when cooperating, produce culture. So why should we not talk to each other? It seems so natural. I think there's one aspect that one 
um, cannot really discuss, and this is the content of belief systems. Uh, they, they are orthogonal to science. Uh, this is why you have to believe these things, you can't prove it. So I, I think there's little point in discussing with somebody who firmly believes in, in a particular version of God or in a particular religion, uh, that he's wrong or right using scientific arguments. This is just this orthogonal. It, you can't do that. But <clears throat> there are certain aspects, and this is what, what I did mainly with, with Mathieu Ricard, this Buddhist monk with whom I wrote a book, and we'll have another book come out now in, in three languages in, around Christmas, that summarizes our, our dialogue that we made over many years, where we try to which extent the phenomena that he describes from a first-person perspective. And these people are highly trained, so they, they have a sharper inner eye than I would assume than, than me. And so they, they have this thousand-year-old tradition of describing mental phenomena from introspection. And I wanted to know to which extent what they describe uh, is compatible with what neuroscientists find from the third-person perspective. So is, is it possible what they say? Do we have a substrate for their particular states into which they get? This was one question. The other question that is pursued by neurobiologists in the moment is to see to which extent one can find functional changes and also structural changes in, in the brains of long-term meditators. Because meditating, as they do it, um, is not just sitting down and relaxing. It's, it's a highly concentrated uh, cognitive process where you have to exert a lot of cognitive control and you train a lot. And like learning juggling and other uh, techniques, which we know produces changes in the brain, um, one would assume that this also changes the brain on the long term. And it does. There is evidence that these practices do change certain parts in the brain. So those are the two aspects that I got interested there. Uh, my own experience was curiosity-driven. I, I wanted to know how it feels if you really do it. And so I took a, a crash course in, in Zen, which is a, a fairly rigid um, session, they call it. So this was for 10 days. You sit every day, uh, eight hours, in front of a white wall and just pay attention to your respiration. That's mainly it. And no, no eye contact with anybody else, no talking and uh, walking every 25 minutes. You have five minutes of walking just to release your, your muscles. Um, and I realized that this really has an effect. Um, I, I didn't continue it because I don't have the time, maybe not, not, the, not the need to do it either. But after three, four days of sitting, um, I felt that my perception changed. Um, I got very calm. Um, and then there were a number of psychophysical phenomena that I could observe because I was trained in, <laughs> in visual science that occurred, which I could interpret, uh, that had to do with the change in the functional setting of my brain processes. Everything slowed down very much. and I. I could focus my attention better to two things at the same time. Um, when I told my teacher, because we had the opportunity every day to talk a few minutes to a supervisor, told me that this was not important at all. I shouldn't pay attention to these things. And then I said, well, but what matters? What is? What should I look for? And it was a she. And she said, well, you will find out. So there was no advice whatsoever. And indeed, I think I found out after a while that what matters is just to not to try to find out and not identify the purpose of all this, but just do it and see what happens. So it was, it was quite rewarding. And I think uh, the feeling I got at the end of um, being able to let myself fall down without being afraid of falling somewhere 
Um, but helped also in other cases of, of crisis. And what about the Pontifical Academy? Did you have any uh, interesting conversations there? Well, the Academy is, is a, a group of uh, scientists. It's self-organizing. It's all natural scientists, at least the Academy I am in. And we have our annual meetings. I'm just leaving for one of them tomorrow. Um, and there we discuss really science, hard-nosed science. Uh, usually aspects that are of, of a more general interest, like the origin of life, or the origin of the universe, or uh, sustainability questions. Um, but all this is done primarily without uh, religious ties. There are, there are members in the academy who come from other religions, it is not a condition to be a Catholic, to be in this uh, academy. Still, we have contacts with members of the Curie every now and then. Uh, there's always also a reception audience uh, with, his, with His Holiness, with the Pope. Um, so there are some discussions on around it um, concerning the relation between religion and science. But as I said, um, I think everybody considers this relation as one that is not amenable to scientific investigation. Um, you, you are in your belief system and you are fine in there if you are fine in there. And if what you believe is in conflict with scientific evidence, then you could as well as a believer say, well then um, do more science you will discover one day <laughs> it will fit. So um, the reason why it's called a belief system is that you have to believe and can't, cannot prove. So in sciences requires proofs, requires evidence. Take the brain as an example. It's an extremely complex system, many, many elements interacting with each other. It is a stable system, it's a highly performing system, but there is no government in there. There is no top-down organization of the processes that make the brain work in a coordinated way. Why? Because evolution um, puts all the stakes in self-organization. Evolution relies on the forces of self-organizing self principles to create a stable state and order. As long as our societies were small, the groups were relatively small, the interactions between the players, they were simple. In such small systems you can coordinate very nicely in a top-down way. You have, you have the, the elder statesman um, who keeps the group together. You have the alpha male in the, in the primate societies. So this principle is fine for small groups, but once the groups get large and the interaction architecture is very, very complex. These groups develop highly nonlinear uh, dynamic behavior. So uh, their dynamics are no longer um, predictable, this is one thing, and they are no longer steerable by changing only a few parameters. If, if you take such a complex system and uh, the brain would be such a system, if you do something in the brain there will be a consequence, but very often it's not the one that you wanted. Um, the same with financial systems, economical systems, political systems. Uh, they are large distributed systems with nonlinear dynamics that develop in a non-predictable way. And if you interfere with them and do something, they will re react to it. But the long-term changes are completely unpredictable. So it becomes very difficult to steer such system in a goal-directed way in a top-down fashion. Therefore, my advice would be for those who live in such systems as all of us, have more confidence in the self-organizing and self-stabilizing powers of these systems, given that the elements in the systems behave properly. You must, in such a system, not lie. Uh, you must not uh, be greedy, but you must be very cooperative. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. If, if bees would lie and fly somewhere and not tell the hive where, where the resources are, but send them in the other direction, they would altogether disappear. 
or if they would be very greedy and collect more than they need for the next winter, the hive would die because it would get, get too warm in there. Anyway, you have to respect certain rules if you want the self-organizing system to be stable and to rescue you. And this is what moral rules are usually good for. And all religions came down to the same suggestions of how you should behave in order to have to behave properly as an individual. But it also implies if everybody behaved like that, you could entirely rely on self-organization to stabilize the system. You wouldn't need um, a mastermind to coordinate all this. For the individual, this means um, but this is, of course, an ideal, it's a dream um, that they should not trust in, in hierarchical uh, organization structures because the, the people on top of these pyramids, in, in extreme cases, the di dictators, they cannot be more clever than the individuals. And the individuals collectively will be more clever than any of, of these uh, central points. So rely more on self-organization and learn to endure that you cannot really control the future. All you can do is act morally and hope it will, will turn out well. But you cannot uh, live with the guarantee that yeah, things will turn out well. I don't know whether, it, it certainly makes a difference, but I don't know whether it's more positive or more negative. I, I don't think that um, we should not allow our kids to, to play with digital toys and, and to have access to this world, um, because it all depends on how it is used. Uh, on the one hand, I think it's a big chance because it allows the horizontal reciprocal connect, uh, communication that you need in a self-organizing system. Uh, the, in the brain, 70% of the nodes, they are connected with each other. Uh, the internet is something similar. Uh, it allows for very, very dense connectivity among the communicating nodes. So in principle, this is a good thing. Um, it's also dangerous because such reciprocally coupled systems they are susceptible to runaway dynamics. Um, an epileptic seizure would be one of them. Um, a self-reinforcing ideology or economical hype is also bad. So there's always a price for something. Uh, on the one hand, it will favor self-organization and equilibrium. On the other hand, it needs to be controlled to some extent. Um, and Living organisms have made great investment in control systems. These are not intelligent systems that um, deal with contents, but they are systems that take care of the homeostasis, of the equilibrium. And we probably will need such systems also in our political and economical systems that do not reach um, economical decisions or things like that, but they just take care of the, of the architecture of interactions, allowing for certain interactions and not for others, and um, making sure that the system does not go into these runaway dynamics. How exactly one would have to structure this, I don't know, one would have to think about it, but it will not work without. Well, I can't say too much about the way in how the Americans deal with these ethical questions. I know that Virtually all cultures have, have abused um, or in, have, in the name of science, um, abused um, other people. Uh, in Germany, this was the, the euthanasia project where mentally disturbed uh, children and, and adults were killed. And then scientists, they, they took the brains to analyze them. Um, because it was a unique occasion for them to get um, well-prepared brains of people with a diagnosis. And you are sitting in a, in a house where inadvertently um, the anatomical sections, the, the microscopic slides, were preserved 
for, from some of these euthanasia victims until 1982, when accidentally it was discovered that in the material that the anatomical connections had contained here, there were cases that had uh, been killed in the euthanasia program. So this is a case where science grossly abused uh, or violated human dignity and um, did not reflect on it. Um, those colleagues who had been doing these studies and who sometimes were actively involved in killing certain uh, persons with certain diseases because they, they wanted to have that brain, they did not feel any guilt when they were interviewed after the war um, by uh, colleagues from the Allies who came here to, to rescue the scientific knowledge that had been accumulated during the Nazi time. So science um, does these things um, for the sake of curiosity. Uh, we have reflected a lot about it because we were confronted with this problem. And I think Germany as a whole had been forced by the Allies to, to reflect about its own history. Um, earlier than other nations were forced to do it, the French worked much less on their um, anti-Semitic programs during this, when they were occupied by Germany started much less, uh, much, much later. Uh, also, their digestion of the, the war in Algeria and the crimes that had been committed is still not finished, this, this work. Um, in America, there were certainly uh, trials with, um, with prisoners. There were oh, these trials with the early phases of the atomic bomb when they had exposed soldiers to, to radiation, which was extremely unethical because at that time one already knew that it, it, was, it was a danger. Maybe that the sensitivity in, in, in Germany is, is a bit higher than somewhere else because of our very dramatic own history. I think the others have never been confronted so bluntly with, with crimes of that dimension. And this is what made us think earlier than the others. Maybe also because we lost the war and were forced by the others, by the Allies, to, to think about it. We had the Nuremberg trial. Nobody was imposing one on any of the other nations. Yeah, I think we still can talk about natural things. Um, fortunately, artificial intelligence is, is far from imitating any of the higher cognitive functions that we have. Well, they can do some image recognition, and but if you look in detail, their creativity is very, very limited. The reason is that the architecture of these systems is still very different from what, what nature has invented. Um, but apart from that, the fact that um, we very often uh, make ourselves the intentional author of an act, uh, even though um, the programming has occurred at an unconscious level, um, this is just because of this dichotomy between conscious and unconscious processing. Um, it appears that we have a very strong need to find reasons for things that happened. This is why we postulate uh, Tor when uh, lightning comes down and so. Um, and the same happens with our own actions. Uh, one can show in many cases that either with patients but also with normal subjects it can be done, that they can be instructed to do something without consciously reflecting about it. it. They perceive what you say and, and their commands and they respond to it, but um, it passes as unconsciously as, as when you drive. You, you see the red light, but you talk at the same time, you stop, and then uh, sometimes you can't even recall that you have seen the red light, but still you have processed all this. Now, it becomes a bit more surprising when, when you find yourself doing something uh, like it can happen with post-hypnotic uh, commands where upon a trigger word you do something um, but you have not intentionally programmed this or because somebody has instructed you and you were not aware of it um, and then you do something and then if you get asked why did you do this then you immediately come with an answer that makes sense to you. Uh, I opened the window because it was too warm or I 
whatever you have to do. <laughs> so th this is a, a post hoc um, explanation for an, an action that you did, because you don't want you to act without reason. So if you can't con consciously recall the reason, you invent one, and you're happy with it. <laughs>